Hey there, friends. I wanted to come in here today to say that a couple of these stories today do include some very sensitive subject matter. And as always, viewer discretion is advised. I will put a warning on those stories specifically, but they're also tagged down below in the description, along with the timestamps. Just a heads up. Enjoy. This started about six months ago. I was getting ready for bed in my room. It was maybe 10.30 p.m. My curtains were closed, so I couldn't see out the window, but I heard three hard knocks on the glass of my window. Of course, that scared the living crap out of me, so I didn't even look, and ran and got my dad, and made him look. Now, I live with my parents and two brothers in a fairly busy neighborhood, so noises weren't uncommon to hear, but this knock was directly on my window, so someone wanted me to hear it. The thing was, my bedroom isn't facing the front of the house, or the road, or anything. My room is actually towards the back of the house, so someone would have had to walk to the backyard in order to knock on my window, which seemed very odd. I had my dad check, but when he opened the curtains, no one was outside the window. He even went in the backyard to check. No one was there. That was the first incident. I closed my curtains and brushed it off as me hearing things or some sort of animal. The following night, at almost the exact same time, I heard another three knocks on my window. Immediately, I went and got my dad again, for him to just see nothing all over again. But this time, I didn't brush it off, and I slept in my parents' room on the floor. The next few nights, there was nothing, until about a week later. I was home alone, and it was about 8.30 to 9 p.m., and I was on FaceTime with my friends when I heard another three knocks on my window. This time I was home alone, so I couldn't go get my dad, but I ran into their room and called them. They told me to call the neighbor to check because they were out of town. So, I did. The neighbor saw nothing. The night after, it was about 1am I think, I heard the knocking again. It wasn't three times though, it was more. It woke me up out of a dead sleep. I was tempted to just look out the window to see who, but part of me didn't want to know. I went and got my parents, who didn't bother to check at this point, because they didn't see anything the last few times. I kept hearing the knocking for the next few nights after, to the point where I ended up just sleeping on the couch. My parents decided to just let me move bedrooms, and so they moved my bedroom into what was the office, and switched everything around, so I hopefully wouldn't hear any more things. After moving bedrooms, I didn't hear anything. It was good for maybe three nights. Then I heard it again. The same knocking. Three hard times. This time I looked out the window. I saw what I assume was a man, or a very big built woman, crouching down, wearing a grey hoodie and some dark jeans. I can't recall the color, it was dark, so maybe grey or black? I closed the curtain and went and got my parents about it, and they informed the police. The police really couldn't do anything because we had no solid proof beside my words. They advised that we get a camera facing my bedroom and around that area of the house. So. That's what we did. I haven't heard the knocking since, but I do wonder who it was. Nonetheless, it makes a good story to tell. I am a female. When I was 16, I lived in the Valley area of Los Angeles. This was many years ago. As I explained in another story, at this time, 
The best part of my week was Saturday nights when I would meet my friends at our beloved Under 21 nightclub to dance the night away. The vast majority of the time I'd have to get a ride there and back. I didn't have my own car until a couple of years later when I was in college. But occasionally, a family friend would lend me his car and on one of these Saturday nights, he did. I felt so independent and free to be able to take myself to the club and to be able to leave when I wanted. On the night of this story, I drove to the club and had a typically great time, dancing with my group of friends to music like Prince and Earth, Wind and Fire. At the end of the night, I got into my borrowed car and headed toward home. In case you don't know, the San Fernando Valley is made up of many suburban towns. None are really small and some are very nice. And, as you would expect, some are less nice with higher crime. I lived with my family in a medium town in the northern part of the valley. It was neither very nice nor very bad, with medium homes on mostly respectable, if not professionally, manicured lawns. And being the greater Los Angeles area, there were many differing routes I could take to get home, whether freeways, highways, or city streets. It was after midnight at this time, but most routes that I could take would still be bustling on a Saturday night. I'd had my fill of loud music, laughter, and chattering voices, so I opted for a quieter route home. I took some busy streets and then veered into some quiet neighborhoods that would take me home. If I drove through some quiet house-lined streets, I would get home a little faster and I was tired. GPS wasn't in use at this time, nor were cell phones, so I had to rely on maps or just knowing the chosen route. I had heard bad things about a town called Pacoima, but I'd only been through it during the day, maybe once. Still, I knew how to get through to shave a few minutes off of my time, and besides, being someone used to walking or taking buses, I felt blissfully perfectly safe now in a well-running car with gas in the tank. I was safer at this moment than at almost any other time. At least, that's what I believed. Still, I was a teenage girl alone after midnight in an area that I was unfamiliar with, and naive enough to think that nothing bad could happen to me in a locked car. I entered a residential street in Pacoima and only had to go a couple of blocks to get to the next town and then to my own. As I slowly drove down a dark, quiet avenue of modest homes, there were streetlights illuminating the unknown. And this also helped with my feeling of invincibility. As I smiled to myself at this, I started to notice a few people walking down the street toward me. At first, I didn't give it much notice. My left turn out of Pacoima was coming up just ahead anyways. But as I got closer, I quickly realized it wasn't just a few people. It was a gang of approximately 12 to 15 men. And they weren't casually walking down the sidewalk, they were aggressively running down the middle of the street, and right towards me. I suddenly had to slow to almost a stop so as to not hit anyone. And this is when they all got a real good look at me. Looks which turned instantly more excited and animated as they realized I was just a young girl, alone. Many exchanged smiling glances between them, and others were whooping, whistling, and calling things out to me. Smoothly, effortlessly, as if they had rehearsed ahead of time, several of them stopped me completely by standing right in front of my car even putting hands on the hood as others walked around to my driver and passenger doors and pulled the handles to open the door. I didn't always lock the doors when I drove, and cars didn't have auto door locks back then, but I was thanking God that I had the foresight to do so on this night. Of course, it all happened very fast, but in my shock and terror it felt like slow motion, so quickly adjusting my mind from carefree to possibly being abducted or worse by this large group of men, they had me trapped. I couldn't drive forward nor reverse out of there, because at this time, the car was completely surrounded by these men. 
And as a couple of guys picked up sticks or other objects to try to bust in my windows, I knew that I had to think clearly and act fast. I did the only thing I could think of. I started driving forward. Having blocked my car completely, I could see the surprise in some of their faces as they knew they had to move out of my way or risk being run over. I had immediately decided that if they didn't move, I would run them over. All of the men standing in front of my car quickly jumped out of the way, and I sped up as I took the left turn out of Pacoima. I did make it home safely, but my heart didn't stop beating out of my chest for the rest of the night. Of course, I thought about it for a long time after as well. I felt proud of the way I'd handled the situation, but I kept running through possibilities of what I could have done differently. What if they didn't get out of the way and I actually had to hit someone with my car? How would I have lived with myself? What if one of the men had pointed a gun at me? I'm very happy that it turned out the way that it did, but it could have turned out so much worse. So, I hope we all keep in mind that we're not quite invincible inside a car, no matter how cozy even heated leather seats may make us feel. Dark, quiet shortcuts are not a good idea, especially late at night, and always drive with your doors locked. So Pacoima gang that tried to grab and do who knows what to a teenage girl driving alone late one Saturday night, it's been a long time since then, and I'm very glad that I didn't meet any of you ever again. This happened about a decade ago, when I was 19. At the time, I rented an apartment in a west side neighborhood of Chicago with my sister, who was a year older than me. We both worked hospitality jobs in the city, and we both had pretty robust social lives. So it was fairly typical for one or both of us to get home at weird hours or be out all night. I would take the pink line to and from work. At this point in my life, I was pretty used to being catcalled while walking down the street. I'd been flashed on public transportation a few times. Men would bump into me from behind on packed trains. Basically the usual amount of sexual harassment for a young woman living in the city. Not much fazed me. Of course it was uncomfortable, but I was never truly terrified. Until one night. That night, I was coming home from work well after midnight. The train car I was in had been empty for most of the ride. One stop before mine, a man gets on and sits down in my car. Reflexively, I look up as this new passenger entered the car. We made eye contact. Immediately, I felt the hairs stand up on the back of my neck. I knew that I made a mistake, and that this might be interpreted as some sort of invitation. I quickly looked away, but I felt him watching me as the train pulled away from the station. Since my stop was only one stop away, I decided to wait until the last second to stand up and exit the car, just in case he tried to follow me. Well, he did. He hung back about 30 feet at first, but I felt the gap between us closing and his footsteps were getting louder. Then I heard him trying to catch my attention, saying, Hey! He catches up to me, and he starts speaking to me like any other man trying to chat me up would. I still couldn't shake the feeling of genuine fear I had since first locking eyes with him in the train car. He asks where I'm headed, and I told him that I'm going home. He asked if there was anyone waiting up for me this late, and I told him my boyfriend was. In reality, I knew my sister was working a night shift, and that I was going home to an empty apartment. Then, he pulled his shirt to the side, exposing a gun in his waistband. In a joking tone, he said that he would fight my boyfriend for me. I laughed along and just kept walking. We were walking down Cermak, which is a pretty busy street, even that late at night. I knew I couldn't let him follow me to my apartment, 
so when I came to the cross street where I should have turned, I just kept going straight. Eventually, I had walked far enough that I passed the stop where he had originally got on the train. He had walked alongside me for a while, and then dropped back and followed me for a while and eventually stopped. I thought I would be relieved once I'd shaken him, but as soon as I couldn't see him anymore, my fear only heightened. I still had to double back to my apartment somehow, and the trains had stopped running at 2am. I figure he knew I'd walked too far and would have to turn around, so I thought it was possible he was posted up somewhere on Cermak, waiting for me. I turned off and walked a few blocks north, and then started my one mile walk back west towards my apartment. The walk back was excruciating, since I was now off the main road, it was much darker and there was absolutely nobody around. I kept telling myself that I had to get home safe for my sister, because she'd never be able to live with herself if something happened to me. I kept putting one foot in front of the other, and when I finally made it into my apartment and locked the door behind me, I collapsed into a puddle of tears. Ten years later on, I've never felt fear again like I did that night, and to this day, I've never told my sister about it. I'm adding a quick warning to this story, as this is one of these stories that does contain very sensitive subject matter, specifically sexual abuse. The OP also added a trigger warning at the beginning, and I will read it, but this warning is included as well. Warning. This contains the very touchy subject of sexual abuse. Don't read it if it might trigger you. I care for all women and men who have been victimized. Just remember that we are strong and we are survivors. I'm a female. When I was 16, I wasn't very happy. I hated school. I didn't have a boyfriend. The only thing I looked forward to was Saturday nights at my favorite disco slash teen nightclub. I didn't have a car, and I had a few friends who would drive me, but I would be devastated if I missed a week. It seems so trivial now, but it was all I felt I had going on in my life at the time. So, occasionally, when I couldn't get a ride, my mom would drop me off as I promised her one of my friends would drive me home. That worked for well over a year. My friends were always there, and one of them always was able to drive me home. Until one night. On this night, I asked my friend Elle, she couldn't that night, so I asked my friend why. She was riding with L. For whatever reason, C couldn't either. My friend T also said no. The same with A and J. Crazy that this had never happened before. I couldn't call my mom to come get me because I knew she wouldn't let me go out again for a long time. And sad, desperate people do dumb, desperate things. By the end of the night... I approached the only person I knew that I hadn't yet asked for a ride. I knew him, but we weren't close friends. He agreed. But he wasn't driving. He was riding with two other guys whom I didn't know. I was hesitant, but desperate. I got into the back seat with the guy that I knew, and I immediately tried to befriend the guys in the front with many uh, thank yous and oh, you're a lifesaver. Almost immediately, they came back with, You owe us. We're going to drive up to the mountains, where you'll repay our kindness. The guy I knew in the back seat with me didn't say anything. He didn't feel that he had a voice between these particular guys, and he was a coward. I was on my own. We had only gone about a mile at this point, and I told them, No, let me out of the car. And they laughed drove me back to the nightclub, let me out of the car, and drove away, continuing to laugh. By this time, the club was completely closed. I was all alone in the dark parking lot out front. My favorite place had never felt so ominous before, with nothing but a single streetlight. This was many years ago, and cell phones weren't really a thing. I would have to walk 
who knows how far in the dark to find a phone booth, and there was nothing around this place. I had no money, and buses didn't run this late. And did I mention that this was on the outskirts of Los Angeles, a huge area with some dark, sketchy, deserted places, especially after midnight? Well, I was in such a place. Just as I was about to panic, a car drove into the lot and a man got out, ignoring me and walking up to the door to see if the club was still open. I told him it was closed. Then, since he had initially ignored me, I felt that he couldn't be a creep. He wasn't looking for a 16-year-old girl, right? So, I asked him if he would drive me home. Stupid, I know. And the adult me is horrified and ashamed that I took such risks back then, and forever grateful that I survived. Anyway, I thought this guy was alone, but as we approached the car, I saw that there were two other men in it. If I'd known, I wouldn't have asked for a ride, and I was immediately regretting the question. The guy leaned in to talk to the other men, and they had a short discussion about me that I couldn't hear. Now, this is relevant, they were all African American men, so I felt that they would feel that I was racist or disrespecting them if I changed my mind now. It mattered to me to show them that I wasn't racist, so I got into the back seat. It was a two-door car, so I couldn't have jumped out if I needed to. Incredibly dumb decision, I know. I tried the same tactic that hadn't worked with the first men, thinking I would befriend them. I told them that all my friends had left and I was going to ride with some other guys, but they were talking about taking me to the mountains and such. I hoped it would inspire sympathy for the poor, dumb teenager. It did not. The driver was clearly the boss. He had very direct, sharp, and memorable eyes that I knew I would never forget. He said, we were kind of thinking the same thing. I froze, terrified, and trapped in the back seat without a door with three complete strangers who were possibly going to assault me, maybe kill me. He continued with, We're going to take you to a parking lot, and then you're going to have sex with us. He then stopped in a dark parking lot a few miles from the club. As he got out of the car and took me with him, he said to the other two men, Don't say my name. He threw me out onto some concrete steps. I was wearing a short dress, so it was easy for him to get to me. I tried to fight, but I knew it was completely futile. He began to assault me, and I cried and prayed out loud. As I tried not to think of what was happening, I just kept praying aloud. And suddenly... He stopped. He said, I'm not going to finish. I'm going to let you go. It's because you were praying. He then got into the car and drove off, not letting the other men touch me. As they drove away, I was still terrified, thinking they might shoot me just to get rid of the witness. Thankfully, they just left me crying, dirty, and traumatized. And still, in the same situation... I still didn't have a way home, and I lived a good 20 or more miles away. I finally got myself up and began walking into the darkness, crying, achy, and bruised, until I saw the lights of an all-night diner ahead in the distance. I just went towards the lights, not knowing what to do, except to make it to the lights. When I got there, the place wasn't busy which made me feel relieved, as I knew that I must look a scary mess. I went to the phone and I still wouldn't call my mom. I knew she'd be asleep, and especially now that it was over an hour since I should have been home, she'd be angry, and she would take away my club privileges. As nightmarish as that night had been, going out one night a week was still all I had left in my life. Uh, see, at that time in my life, I consciously believed and repeated to myself that if I completely disappeared off the earth, no one, not even my busy single mom or brother who hated me, 
no one would even notice that I was gone. So, I called one last good friend with a car. He lived all the way in Pasadena, far from where I was. He answered, but said that he was asleep, and that the drive was just too far. Even though I told him that something really bad had happened to me, he refused. See, the lack of people who cared deeply about me was part of why I felt I had nothing in my life. So I did the last thing that I could do. I sat at a table and talked to the restaurant manager. Since she was a stranger to me, I didn't mind telling her the whole story. Every awful thing that had happened that night. She was appalled and very compassionate. She asked one of her most trusted employees to drive me home, and he did. I arrived safely at home, and I was never as happy to be there as I was in that moment. I never told any of my friends what happened to me that night, and to this day, my mom doesn't know. I felt so ashamed and stupid for making all the wrong decisions that night, and actually almost counted myself lucky that it hadn't been much worse. I didn't go to the police because I didn't want anyone to know, and anyway I had no way to identify those men. I continued to go to that club, but only when I arranged for a ride home in advance. And here's the very weird denouement. Remember the friend that I'd called who wouldn't come get me? A couple weeks later, he told me that he'd heard I'd gotten a ride with Mark D a member of a very famous singing family at the time. I looked at a photo I found of the group and, indeed, I saw those sharp eyes that I would never forget. And that's why he said to the two other guys, don't say my name. And that's why he was the leader in that group of friends. The one thing I will never understand though, is how did he know my name? How did he tell someone who knew me that he had given me a ride? This was a very long time ago, like I said. 1981, to be exact. I'm a much different, strong, independent woman now, so these things don't hurt me to recall. I did always want to tell the world what the famous Mark D did to me, but I didn't. That's okay. I would probably fully name him here if I thought it was allowed, but this is my first Reddit post, and I don't know much. I just want all the young people now to know what I didn't know back then. Always listen to your gut. That cannot be overstated enough. And never ride with strangers. It sounds so simple, and situations like mine was are all different. But your life is worth so much more than anything else like that stupid nightclub that I thought was so important then. Thank you for reading my story. I encountered this on the 2nd of January, two days ago when I was asleep in my room. I'm 18, female, and I live in Singapore with my parents. I'm sorry if this story is long, but I would appreciate it if you took your time to read and comment your thoughts. In my family, it's only myself, 18, female, my mom, 38, female, and my stepdad, 40, male, living in a small apartment. I have my own bedroom as I'm an only child. My parents took the smaller room and I had the master bedroom, which has a big window that is facing the back of our house. For my bedroom, there's a big space outside our window that's between every apartment unit here, so there's no way someone would unintentionally stand near my window. You have to walk in and go for a few turns before coming here. I eventually fell asleep around 11pm, and I forgot to close my blackout curtains from my window. Even though it's a frosted window, anyone can only see through it if they stood close to it for a closer look. At exactly 1.23 a.m., I checked the time when I woke up, I heard three loud knocks on my room window, which eventually woke me up as I'm a very light sleeper. At where I'm sleeping, 
My window is on the right corner, and I can see whatever shadow that gets through it in the day or night. On that night, I didn't switch on any of my lights, so it was total darkness, except for my table lamp that was shined on me at the highest brightness. At first, I was sleeping while facing my room door, which is on my left, so I had an automatic response to turn my head and look at what was knocking on my window. To my surprise, I saw a silhouette of a man's head that was clearly visible in my window. I had goosebumps, and I froze because I was unsure of what to do, as the curtain was wide open, so obviously that man could see through my window. Despite my parents' room being right next to mine, I went into shock and had to call my mom. She was asleep, to help me check if I was tripping and to close my curtains for me. I told her what I saw afterwards. In the end, she advised me to sleep in the living room for the meantime to calm myself down. I felt really uneasy that night and I couldn't go back to sleep. Since I stayed awake that night, I heard three more knocks coming from my bedroom at 3 a.m., which of course I had to assume had come from the window. Before this happened, my curtains were already closed and blocking my window's view, so I thought that it would be fine for me to go ahead and get a look at who or what knocked on the window. The only difference this time is that the knock was louder, but slower, like the ones you would experience if you were in an old haunted house. Come to think about it, I wish that I had just stayed curious and stayed in my living room. I had my face and hand holding onto the window since I had to get closer and clearer look, since I didn't see a silhouette when I was standing from a distance from the window, and me still being paranoid from what happened hours before. I saw a man who was about 1.8 meters standing outside my room window, about 4 meters away just standing and staring right at me, who was currently frozen in place at the window when I saw him. He was wearing long gray pants and a black t-shirt, and he had really, really pale skin. It looked as if he had no expression when he saw me. By the time that happened, I wasn't really sure if it was the same man that had stood outside at around 1.30 a.m. As much as I was tired that night, I knew that I was not hearing things or seeing hallucinations. I was perfectly wide awake when I saw that man. Moral of the story, always check your windows before falling asleep, and it's best to get blackout curtains to protect yourself. Of course, you can also guard your window with other protective measures. subject matter is the other story, and this definitely could be sensitive to others, so trigger warning on this one as well, and yeah. I just wanted to start this off by saying that I love your podcast. I listen to it every night before I go to sleep, and it keeps me entertained for hours when I'm just pottering around the house, so thank you. Thank you as well. I was 19 when this happened. I woke up one morning and saw that I had three missed calls from an unknown number. Two were just after midnight, and the third was a little past 1am. I sleep with my phone on Do Not Disturb, so none of these calls came through for me. I didn't think much of it, as my mom has some mental health issues, and is always calling on unknown numbers. I forget about it and moved on with my day. It was the next day, and I was going out to a club with some girlfriends. It was a Sunday night, and there was a special guest at the club, so we all bought tickets and headed over. I'd had a few drinks, but I wasn't drunk, just a little tipsy. I was completely aware of everything around me, so I can promise that I did not misunderstand the situation or imagine any of this. It was around 1am, and I was walking through the dance floor when I felt my phone vibrating. I was getting a phone call from an unknown number. By the time I saw the call pop up on my phone, I once again had already missed two calls from them just a few minutes earlier. I answered the phone, and whoever was on the other side hung up immediately. 
Of course, they called back within a few seconds of ending the other call. I finally answered. Hello? I said. Keep in mind, I'm in a club, so I couldn't hear a thing. I said to whoever was on the phone, Don't hang up. Let me go somewhere quiet so I can hear you. The man on the other line replied, Okay, you go somewhere quiet. I went to the bathrooms, where it was a little quieter, and could finally hear what this man was trying to say to me. He said to me, Aaron, this stays between us, okay? Okay, I replied back. I didn't recognize the voice at all. However, he referred to me by my first name, so he obviously knew who I was. The voice on the other end of the phone said to me, clear as day, I'm going to rape you one day, Aaron. I didn't have any time to process what he had said before he hung up. I sank to the floor and started crying. I was in shock. Keep in mind, I'm 4'11 and not even 50 kilograms. I'm an easy target, I'm little. Obviously, being tipsy and at a club, I made the decision to leave. I called my ex that I had recently broken up with, and I asked if he could come pick me up. From there, we went directly to the police station. They asked me to come back the following day and give a statement when I was sober, so that's what I did. The police took my claim very seriously and could not have been more helpful. They took all my details down, and my phone specs, I'm assuming so that they could trace the call. I finished up with the statement and went home. I took a couple of days off work just to process what had happened, and also because I was terrified to leave my house, to go to work, and even walk to my car once my shifts were over. I worked in a shopping center slash mall, so I had to walk to the underground car parks at 10am after work. A week went by, and I didn't receive any more calls from the unknown number. Nothing at all. The police did get back to me, though, and this is the unnerving part. They told me that they had managed to trace the call back to a phone box. They couldn't tell me the specific area due to all the different call towers or something like that. I'm not too sure how it all works. However, it was a phone box the ones that are on the side of the road that you need to put coins in. Yeah, one of those. When you put it into perspective, someone had gone out of their way at 1am on a Sunday night to go to this phone box, with enough money to call me multiple times. I also have no doubts that this was the same person behind the unknown calls from the previous night also, which also means this person went out of their way multiple nights in a row just to call me and threaten me. It's now been almost five years since this happened, and I have never found out who it was. My stomach still drops when I see a no-caller ID come up on my phone. I don't know who this person was. I don't know if he was being serious or just trying to scare me. I really don't want to find out, though. This isn't as scary as some of the other stories on here, but it is my own creepy encounter. Thank you for taking the time to listen. I used to sneak out at ages 15 through 17. I don't anymore as I have my own life going on as I am an adult now. It was about 2.30, almost 3 o'clock at night. I was going to a friend's house as they were going to sneak me in, chill, and have a smoke session. While I was walking to their house, it was already creepy as it was. The night was still and the sounds creeping around made everything eerier. I made it to their house without any issues. We lit a few cigarettes and did as I said before. I do not condone smoking or doing anything in this story to anyone under the age of 18. When it started to get late, I went back to my house. It was about a 15 minute walk at most. Everything stayed the same until I was going down a hill. There was a lot of houses where I lived, but it wasn't a good neighborhood to be honest. I have a lot of stories about it that I'll possibly share in the future. 
I got stopped by this tall guy. I'm a woman, about 5'5", five five, and very skinny with little to no muscle, so anyone could just beat me and do other horrible things to me. He was a drug addict, as he looked very ill and had some red spots on his skin. He asked if I had a lighter, and I did, but I lied and said no. He nodded and then made small talk as I contributed back to the small talk, backing away slowly and eventually leaving. I felt very odd. I felt as if I was being watched or followed. A very uneasy feeling. I turned back and saw the same guy. He asked again if I had a lighter. Again, a bit annoyed and scared, I said no. I knew it showed my voice, but I started to speedwalk to my house, as I had to go up another hill and down a hill to reach my house. I still had that feeling lurking in my stomach, and my mind started to race. I turned back and saw the same damn guy, asking the same question. I looked around and found a group of guys who I thankfully knew. I said no and then darted across the street to greet them telling them what happened, and one of them walked me back to my house. If it wasn't for knowing a lot of people at my age, I probably would have been attacked. I'm thankful every time and get goosebumps by thinking about it. For those who think it's fun to sneak out, please don't. It's not worth your life or to add trauma in any way. Stay safe out there, and Raven, thank you for sharing my story. So that, my friends, was a collection of some late night horror stories. True scary stories that take place at night. Now, I want to address something really quick. I mentioned at the beginning of the video, two of these stories mentioned um, sexual assault. I do my best to not typically read stories that contain that kind of stuff, because I know that it can be very painful for people that have experienced it. And that said, both of those stories were submitted directly to me by the people who experienced those situations. And as such, I feel that it would be disrespectful of me to not read their stories solely because it contained that kind of stuff. I hope that makes sense to you guys. I don't like reading about it because it can be painful, but if somebody submits their story and it does involve it, I will put a warning at the beginning of the story and then read it to respect the person that went through the situation. They are talking about their experience. They sent it to me to read to my audience. They want the information out there. They want people to know what they went through. As such, it's only appropriate that I do, I guess. I hope that makes sense. I know I'm probably over explaining things, but it just feels right to kind of explain it to some extent because I know I don't cover those kinds of things too often. Even though I do cover creeps, that specific topic doesn't happen as much in my channel, so... I don't know. Moving on, hopefully you all enjoyed the stories. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button as it does help. If you're new to the channel and want more content like this, please consider subscribing. That helps as well. And if you're feeling ever so bold, you can go down below the video, leave me a comment letting me know your thoughts, how you're doing, how your week's going, and if you have any plans for this weekend. I don't. Work. That's about it. May take a day off if I can get ahead a little bit more, but other than that, it's just work. So, yeah. You can also join Patreon and memberships for get early access to content like this, and so forth and so on. And of course, I hope you do remember, friends, that you are loved, you are valid, you are important, you're the best you that you can be. Please don't forget it. And don't let anyone tell you otherwise. And until I see you again, my beautiful friends, much love and sleep well.